Good morning. You're listening to Southern Remedy for Women, where we address issues of health and wellness from a woman's perspective. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Owens. And as you heard, Dr. I'm joined today in the studio. I mean, the mic came on just when I cleared my throat. And I'm far from the mic. Dang. Yeah. So anyway. I'm here. Indeed. We are here Mm -hmm. on this lovely Friday, almost afternoon. Yay. Um, guys, you know, our conversation today is going to um, center around sex, which is a very healthy part of um, of our lives. And so and also a, a very important part of healthy relationships. And so while, you know, sex doesn't always um, equate with love. We are on the eve of Valentine's Day, so um, this is usually the time when we have this conversation. So we just decided, what what the heck, we're going to stick with it. Um, so the number is one eight seven seven MPB ring. That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. You can always drop us an email um, to remedy at mpbonline.org. Um, and if you want to be anonymous with your question um, so that nobody knows what you're up to, that's perfectly fine. You can feel free to use any name or no name, and we will still take your calls and questions. Um, good morning, Allie Brown. What's up, Michelle Owens? How are you? I'm really good. It's a beautiful day outside. I kind of woke up with some pep in my step, and uh, it's Friday. Friday. And then I remembered. Womp womp. <laughs> <laughs> it's Michelle Owens' favorite show of the year, which makes me verklempt and blushy. It's the sex show today. Yeah. But I'm 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 here for it. Okay. I looked up some stuff, I did some research. Things made me giggle. You know, I, why you know, it how, why it, the discomfort it, is pal- is palpable, right? <laughs> Jay, our it producer's laughing is, at me. Our, yeah, so the the production booth is is going hilarious right now. Um, Liz Gill, our call screener, is sitting anxiously awaiting to take your calls. Our phone lines are entirely open. Um, you, you sounded uncomfortable just saying that you are uncomfortable <laughs> with it. At least I can admit it, right? That's I have so an understanding funny. of my own emotions. Oh my gosh. But you know, so it's interesting, right? This is kind of a, it's kind of like a, a taboo topic, which kind is why of. I love I the fact that we get it. No, I think that I love the fact that, you know, that um, our 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 MPB folks have have given us some uh, a little bit of creative freedom here to um, to kind of have this conversation because you know there are medical issues that can influence people's um, sexual performance. It can influence um, libido and other things, and so we need to have some places we can talk about this stuff. Like where where right. exactly and do you go? It makes a big difference. I mean, it's a big part of people's lives. It frankly. really does. And I'm telling you, so in in my practice, just being able to ask questions of of my patients about that part of their lives or their relationships and and how things are going and if they're having issues and problems it's just like amazing how um just answering asking the question uh, a lot of times just the floodgates open because there aren't really places that people feel very comfortable having these conversations and so um so we are providing that for our listening audience today Again, um, the number is one eight seven seven MPB ring, and our phone lines are open. And we're going to be taking any of your questions or comments, um, any tips that you have, anything that that works, or if you're um, having issues related to libido or other things, please feel free to give us a call. Um, and like I said, we we actually we do a little work for this thing. We um we've been we've done some research and and have some uh, some resources and references. So we are looking forward to being able to share that with our listening audience. Um, over the course of the next hour. So, Dr. Brown. <laughs> <laughs> and and so I am so I am forcing my uh, my co-host to participate in this show for the next hour because she's I'm like here. Totally freaked out. The, by the phone lines are ringing already. Totally. Great. That's because people want to talk about this, and they're going to yeah they're dying yeah, to have an opportunity okay. to talk about this thing. Yep. Okay. Um. So. So you had mentioned something to me. Um, oh God! No, I'm just on the break when we were. <laughs> See, this is this is already going bad. It's going bad already. Um, no, you had mentioned something to me um, as we were uh, right after the billboard when we were getting ready this morning about some of the some of the the research that you had done. So why why don't I, I just toss this very to loosely. you? Toss this to oh, you, you so that you can so that you can share. Well, I was Dr. looking. Brown. I like to look at like uh, you know medical websites, kind of reputable websites, looking at common myths because you know things that come up. Oh my gosh. 
<laughs> things. I'm just listening uh, to you. That's it. Subjects that arise. Yes. Um, on things like that are probably pretty common. You know, that must be things that people actually um, believe or experience, etc. And I was reading these common sexual myths, and they just made me giggle so much. But I know a lot of that is discomfort. But I, I there are a lot of people out there. I think that are misinformed. Absolutely. About um, uh, sexually transmitted infections, Mm -hmm. um, about how you can get pregnant. Yes. uh, What constitutes sex. I mean, that depends on who you ask, of course. But um, some interesting things we're talking about, things that are not contraception, you know, things that do not prevent pregnancy, which are taking a shower after sex. Some people, I guess, think that, that if you wash real good, it's going to make it okay. Okay. Uh, using douche or some sort of vaginal cleanser does not prevent pregnancy. Can I just, like, <laughs> inter- interject there? Don't douche. Just don't. Don't do it. It's don't. not right. The vagina is a self-cleaning organ. Don't do that. Yeah, you mess it, up everything. Yeah, there's all kinds of, like, stuff in there that your body has that's able to help it correct itself and get back to normal. Um, and when you douche or use those feminine cleansing products or other things, you oftentimes will will mess up the good thing. Like, and, and even if it's, and the other part is that if you do notice an unusual odor, because sometimes people will say, sometimes it's about feeling clean and fresh. Mm-hmm. And then other times you may notice an odor or something like that. And if that's the case, then I would say you need to get it checked out because mm-hmm. usually those are things that douching alone are not going to fix. Like can, you, infects ca- can in fact cause, right? Absolutely. Ba- the and can make bacterial it worse. vaginosis, Indeed. Right? Can definitely make it worse. So, so please don't do that. Um, just, it, just don't buy it. Just leave it on the shelf. It, and, and, and the vagina will take care of itself. And if you have a problem that persists, then you need to have that checked out. But, yeah, that in general, um, those cleansing products, just, just don't. Just let it go. Let it go. Let it go. So we have a couple of callers on the line. We're gonna um, we're gonna p- press pause on um, Dr. Brown's wonderful myths. Thank you. For and that. we are going to go to the phone lines and hear from Mikey, who's calling us from Mobile. Good morning, Mikey. <laughs> Good morning. I I love this topic and I love the way that you're addressing it. Um, and so I hope that you will allow me to be um, my own free spoken, free spirited self here. And say that, um, uh, first of all, I don't like the, uh, you know, the idea of it being called sexual performance. I mean, you know, performance is like when you're, you know, when you're doing a play as an actor or when you're, you know, like doing a show as a musician and you're there for the audience stuff. I think that, you know, other, other terms like communication, you know, <laughs> um, uh, I mean, particularly since sex itself is so widely, widely um, diverse Mm -hmm. among, you know, both the, um, both recipients, hopefully, it's it's a happy, you know, thing like that. So, um, anyway, that's, like I said, I just don't like the the term performance. I love that. I love it. Um, So, I I totally get that. Um, And, you know, I think, like you said, it... This is a so so the actual act of intercourse itself um, is one of the uh, one of the highest forms of intimacy. For heaven's sake, what? <laughs> sexual experience. I, mean, I I got plenty of words you for go. you, Mikey. Yeah, sexual yeah, like experience, <laughs> um, sexual healing. <laughs> Yeah, you know, okay. my mom is German, so <laughs> we always make fun of the German language because it's kind of harsh. And literally translated, the word for sex in German is gender traffic. Wow! <laughs> so that it's not just you know, it, it's all cultures. We have weird yeah. names for it. Well, I think, but but no, I think what Mikey um, mentions is actually a really good point because it is like sex is 
many things to to many people and um so i get that and i didn't mean to use the term performance in a pejorative man in a, in a pejorative way um but i t- do totally get the whole concept of how it can be very intimate and very expressive and it can be a form of communicating a, a very high level of connection and um and and love to a human being um and then You know, in other cases, maybe not so much, but, um, you know, we do recognize that that humans are sexual beings. And that is also a very important part um, of of most of our lives. And so one of the things that we want to do is just make sure that we are giving accurate information. We'll go back to Dr. Brown's myths in a few minutes, but we do have another call on the line, but we want to make sure people get accurate information. And here's the thing, whatever sex is to you, that is that is totally an individual and a very personal thing. And so what what I will also say is part of our disclaimer is that the way that we describe or discuss um, sex today, it may be very different to someone else. And so by no means are we trying to opine that um, that opinion um, or our interpretations to anybody because we do recognize it is an incredibly personal um, situation. And so with that being said, we are going to go to the phone lines again and hear from Ron, who's calling us from Tupelo. Good morning, Ron. Well, good morning. How are you? I'm doing great. I just wanted to say I remember, um, you know, before our daughter came along, things were different, really, between my wife and I. I mean, you know, I could send her, I'd be traveling, send her, say, okay, go to the airport, I got a ticket, fly down to meet me in New Orleans tonight. And, you know, we had these years together. We agreed before we had kids, we would have these years together, I think maybe six. And um, we really, really had a great time. Went to the New Orleans World's Fair, as a matter of fact. But anyway, after you have a child, your priorities really really and truly have to be the child if you aren't ready for that then don't have kids get all that out of your system but now we're older at the hey, new orleans world fair it tells you how old i am <laughs> 1984 <laughs> i believe yeah what i think it was in 1984 I'm 84. No, yeah, 1984 <laughs> I think. I'm kidding. i remember going as a kid <laughs> Oh, I hate you. No I'm, <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. But anyway, you know, as we've gotten older and um, we're about to approach our 41st anniversary here in awesome. a month. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my wife told me a few years ago, the sexiest thing you do, and she makes it known it is the sexiest thing I do. She tells me and demonstrates this. Um she gets home and I clean the house up or she gets home all the dishes are washed and dinner's on the table then things get a lot more romantic <laughs> <laughs> that's called wife porn that's correct I think there's a whole Instagram account dedicated uh, to that Ron well, you know I hear well, what you're no, saying no, though no, wait wait I, I gotta go get on the internet now what <laughs> <laughs> It's men cleaning the house and taking the kids to school and cooking dinner. <laughs> you know, I, I I think that though that that actually raises a really good point, Ron. So, like, what do you? So, is that what you do now to kind of keep the fire kindled? You said you're coming up on forty one years, um, and and that is really no small feat. I mean, forty one years. Um, marriage is hard, and so for you guys to have that special sauce, like. You know, you said you've had children. Dr. Brown and I both have kids. They they really kind of can make it. I won't say that they totally squash out the embers, but you you got to really work and be intentional, I think, when you have children. Or if you have anything that's really a distraction, something else that you focus your attention on when you are in a relationship to really keep the fire going. So, I mean, what do you say? Just clean the house or i mean what other what other um tips would you have for our listening audience do you mean while the kids are still home or after the kids are finally finally gone come back home and go again i don't know maybe lock them out for 10 or 20 minutes i just whatever whatever you got what what recommend what, what recommendations do you have well you do have to block out time and you know i had a had a lady i rented an apartment from years ago and she told me 
before I got married. She said, what you have to do, my first marriage failed. And what you have to do when you have kids, you have to tell the kids, when they're old enough to understand, that mom and dad come before you. And I think your kids have to understand that mommy and daddy are more more important than you are. And I know that's a hard thing, but I grew up understanding that. My sister and I grew up understanding that. Mom and dad were here before us. You know, I remember my sister and I late one night were talking, and she said, do you think our parents could kill us? Oh, goodness. I said, I said, she said, this is taking an interesting said, no, turn, yeah. No, we're, we're kids. That, and she, and she, she said, could they take us out? And I said, no, I think, I think that's illegal. But we weren't sure. I love it. Well, I've heard no, somebody no, no, say, no. Ron, I've heard somebody say that children are part of your family, but they are not part of your marriage. And I think that that's basically kind of I, the, the general concept. I think, um, you know, everybody has their, their space and, and children, of course, require a lot and are prioritized. But I think that one of the best things that we give our children is modeling a healthy marriage for them. Um, and, and even if the parents aren't married, seeing their parents get along well and, and function as a unit, I think is really a great gift to children. I think it's a stabilizing force that really means the world to them and, and sets them off on the best path for um, success. But thanks so much for your call and thanks so much for sharing. So, um, so Dr. Brown, that was kind of that was kind of interesting. Ron, uh, Ron said he talked about the things that that he does that are really sexy. And I think that's interesting. You know, like what people feel like is sexy to them can be very different, it's right? Diverse. Like, yeah, and and it may change, right? Like the thing that really was exciting to you, you know, in the very beginning might not be exciting, or it may change in a shorter period of time. Like there there aren't really any great rules, you know. I just wanted to, to Jay speaks. I know Jay point. only speaks during you the guys, session. You that rarely hear true. our producer. You rarely hear him. That Here is he is, true. none other than the great Jay White. Jay has a lot of children. Right, that's true. <laughs> he does. Figure out what causes that eventually. He cleans, he cleans the house a R- lot, very R- well. Ron brought up a great point that um, people have different. And he didn't say it like this, but people have different love languages. If you've read that book, yes, or taken those tests or anything like that. And my wife is the same. She is a acts of service person. I'm very much an intimacy and touch person. And and those are kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum. So, like, my whole uh, experience is trying to romance. And an acts of service person, they're, like, they're missing that, that receptor. I mean, I mean you can... <laughs> You can uh, fill the entire bed with roses, hire a mariachi band, and 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 rope the Tuscan sunset like, and bring it back you take to your house. Trash. But and did you take out the trash? That's all fine and good. But if I unload the dishwasher, it's it, it, the impact of that is like eighty thousand times what all of those other things combined times infinity. Well, it's good that you know that. Points yeah. would score. Well, I am 42. It it's only very took, seductive. It only took about four decades of life to <laughs> figure that out. But it, it, that, is, um, that is something that I, I have learned. And, and people, the love languages. Different people have different. Uh, oh, surely. Those, those, those different things that put them in the right frame of mind. Yeah, absolutely. So, guys, the phone lines are open. That number is one eight seven seven mpb ring Thanks so much, Jay, for that. Um, and it's time for us to take our first break of the hour. Uh, we are talking about sex. So please give us a call, comments, and questions. We will be taking them after this, na- after this short break. No matter if you use an app to start your car or still have a flip phone, Everyday Tech can decipher today's technology for tomorrow's solutions. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or the MPB public media app. This is Southern Remedy for Women on MPB Think Radio. This is the show all about addressing issues of health and wellness from a woman's perspective. And sex. I'm not, okay. I'm Dr. <laughs> Allie Brown, and I'm here as you hear with my co-host, Dr. Michelle Owens. And 
Valentine's is approaching, so I always know that Dr. Owens is going to want to have our annual show about sexual health and well-being. We really should talk about this more. It shouldn't just be a once a year okay, thing. Okay, well, let's do it <laughs> biannually. And that's what we're talking about today. Our phone number is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. You can use a uh, fake name if you'd like. You don't have to say your city if you're, you know, embarrassed like me. Or if you're just uh, flying the flag, then you just do what Michelle Owen says and own it. You know, it is what it is. But if to, you know, we are here for all of you folks in the listening audience. We've had some excellent calls so far, and we have been talking about some myths, some common myths about um, sex and sexual wellness. And uh, should we go talk about a few more? Yeah, you want to talk about the big O? Let's talk about the O. Okay, well, you go on on that, because my research was more about how, how you can and can't get pregnant, and some of these get quite colorful, but you go on ahead. Oh, my goodness. No, I just, so I think that one of the things that um, is, so in the process of sexual arousal and sexual gratification, um, there... Not performance. Not performance. See, I, I, I told... I told you, and Mikey, Mikey. I got words. I got words. Um, So, you know, we had kind of talked about different things that might be sexually attractive. But I think one of the things to talk about is is this concept of of sexual climax or orgasm, right? And um, I think this is especially um, important because there are discrepancies between um, males and females, men and women, um, as it pertains to um, their sexual experiences. And that kind of, you know, makes sense. There are different sexual um, hormones and um, and that kind of stuff. But I thought that this was something that's really important to discuss and to bring to the forefront because um, cause a lot of women struggle with having, with issues related to sexual satisfaction. And so there are large numbers of women who either have not or do not um, experience orgasm during sex. And those numbers are actually much higher than many would think. So if you are a person who has difficulty um, with achieving climax or an orgasm, um, you are not alone. Um, and, and And the research shows that like 85% of men will actually experience an orgasm um, during sexual intercourse. But, oh, sorry, Mike, I know you don't like that word. But but during the act of sex, 85 to 90 percent of men will actually experience um, orgasm. That number for women is much less. Like, it's really more around 60 percent. And so um, the other part is that that the type of stimulation that leads to climax can be very different between men and women. And um, and it's not always what you think, right? Like it's not just always focused on the particular organ. Like, for example, with women, it's not always penetration that leads to Orgasm. There are some women who don't achieve orgasm through penetration. Um, and then there are some who actually um, achieve orgasm through external stimulation. So whether it's um, with stimulation of the clitoris um, as opposed to actual vaginal penetration. So there are, there are multiple ways to reach that climax. And I think it's really important to, to kind of know your body, know what works for you, communicate that to your partner so that, so that it does end up being a, a communication, a mutually beneficial um, experience for both of you. And I think sometimes it's difficult because you don't want to kind of be the backseat driver, right? Like you don't want to tell somebody what they're supposed to be doing, but you know what works for you. You know what feels right for you. Um, And there are some, um, there are medications and other things that are available. Um, And um, there are toys and, and lubricants and all kinds of things that you can use in your armamentarium to ultimately help you get to that point. And so helping people to be more communicative about this part of their relationship, I think is really important because that's the way that you ultimately get to gratification, to some sense of, of, um, fulfillment and, and true sexual wellness. 
Allie's really quiet, so we're going to go to the phone lines and hear from KT, who's calling from Green. Because <laughs> that's what it says. Good morning, Where KT. Where you at, KT? <laughs> well, I came to the show a little bit late, but... No uh, worries. I have, I'm good. So I have a question about uh, female libido. Uh, my, I went through um, uh, prostate... Uh, had prostate cancer a few years ago, so I take C. Alice and because that works better for the BPH and stuff like that. My wife is post menopause, and I know she's concerned about libido, and we've talked about it, and she kind of shy about talking about that. Can y'all talk about post menopausal women and libido, please, and if there's really anything that's uh, available for for the ladies like that? Yeah, so um so thank you so much for your for your question. That actually uh, um is a great question and something that a lot of women uh struggle with. And here's the thing. Um life doesn't end at menopause. Um and for a lot of women they go through this process of self-discovery and reinvention, if you will. Um, and so there are all kinds of ways that they can that that they that we um adjust to the new normal. So there are some women who, when they go through menopause, of course, the the estrogen levels or our female hormone levels drop um, because our ovaries don't uh, continue to produce those hormones anymore. And so for some women, but not all, um, they do experience a, a concomitant decrease in libido. Now, sometimes it is that they actually have a decrease in desire but for some women, the decrease in their activity is not really related to a decrease in desire. They still very much want to um, have a healthy sexual activity, but it can be uncomfortable. And so with decreasing estrogen, um, the actual vagina itself changes. The skin becomes thin and the glands um, don't work as much or don't produce as much lubrication. And so it is not uncommon for um, women to feel dysperunia or discomfort during sex, uncomfortable sexual intercourse um, as a result. So some of the things that can help with that, of course, you can um, use lubricants. You can use um, local estrogen. So this is not estrogen that you're taking by mouth. A lot of women are uncomfortable with the idea or have been advised against um, hormone replacement therapy. So if they're not on hormone replacement therapy or don't or can't take um, hormones, then you can actually use estrogen cream, which is local. So you just put it topically um, on the vagina and the skin around the vagina, and that can actually help um, with uh, problems related to vaginal irritation. However, there are some women who... Um, who do have decreased libido overall. And there are medications, different types of medicines. Um, and depending on, I would say for those folks, you should probably see um, an OBGYN who um, would be comfortable or even one of the menopause. Some women have, um, some OBGYNs have special expertise in uh, care of women who have gone through menopause and those in the perimenopausal and postmenopausal period. There are several different medications um, that can be utilized to kind of help with um, libido. There's also um, excuse me, um, you mentioned Cialis, which is one of the medications um, for that will help with um, male decreased libido or decreased um, um, erections. But there's also um, a female pill, if you will, that has just recently been um, approved by the FDA, probably within the past couple of years, um, that is also... Um, for that indication to help with um, a hypoactive sexual disorder or for those people who have decreased libido. So there, the good news is that if that is where your wife is, there are several different um, options that are available to kind of help. Um, but the other part is just kind of to, to be um, vigilant about finding the thing that ultimately will work. Um, and I just wish you guys the best of luck as you try to keep those flames a-going. Oh, yes, yeah, so that's fine. I very much appreciate it. I didn't know about the, the new medications, and she's a little bit shy about talking to her OB about that, so I heard you lying about that. So I will, I'll pass that on, and that'll help us in the uh, continuing our conversation 
with uh, with her concerns. Absolutely, she's, absolutely. So, she's my wife. I love her. And, oh, uh, wonderful! All right. Well, good luck to you guys. Y'all have a great Valentine's. Thank you, all. You too. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great point right there. People's reluctance to maybe talk about it with their healthcare providers, and I'm being shy over here. But that that's the thing, like overcoming the stigma and realizing that other people are talking to that same doctor. You know, that's their that's your doctor too about this. It's not something strange or unusual. It's actually quite common issues, and if you don't ask about it, you'll you'll. You'll never know. The doctor doesn't go home at night and laugh and say, oh, I had so-and-so in the office today, and she's having problems with her libido. That doesn't happen. I mean, no. that's, that's not what's going on. Yeah, that's, and, yeah. and sometimes I think um, it's really helpful because, you know, we're, when we forget to bring it up, like, I have to consciously make a note to myself over time until it became a part of my routine, um, my routine care. But, like... You do. You Sometimes you forget to ask those questions or we ask in a very general way. Do you have any questions? How's everything going? And so usually when people ask that, they don't know that that they can even talk to you about it. Like, oh, well, can, how's everything going? Oh, well, great, except for I'm not really feeling like having sex. Like people might right. not necessarily get to that place. And so I feel like um, it's incumbent on, on us as healthcare professionals to open doors for those conversations. But the other piece is, oh, this this like sex thing relationally is important and it is part of your overall health and well-being. And so I would say that even if you're a little shy or embarrassed, um, just see it as any other health concern. And um, if you, it doesn't matter, it can be your cardiologist. They'll just tell you, hey, you should probably talk to this person about that. But um, just find someone who you trust um, and and share that information with them. I hope that they I hope for everybody under the sound of my voice that there is a health care provider that you have a relationship with that you feel comfortable discussing issues related to intimacy and knowing that that person would take you seriously, that they would listen to you, that they would hear you and try to help you. Um, and if you don't find that person, because you need that person in your life, you need that person to be on your health care team. Absolutely. The number is one eight seven seven MPB ring. That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. We're going to go back to the phone lines and talk to Pops, who's calling us from Mobile. Mm-hmm. Hey, Pops. Good morning. Hey, good Thank morning. You for being here. I uh, am old, and uh, I'm wondering a couple of things. Uh, Sex is almost non-existent, and I'm wondering: Do you recommend hormones for males to uh, re- rejuvenate? And also, uh, can you give me any advice about how to, uh, you know, respark the machine or the, uh, the engine, and any hints that I could have to make sure that my mate is also enjoying our adventure? And I'll just hang up and listen to the radio and let you talk about any advice you might give to older older men. Absolutely. So, um, so pops, I'm I'm an OBGYN by training, so I don't really get a chance to um, to take care of a lot of older men. However, I do take care of their partners, um, and I do also work very closely with um, urologists, and those are typically um, outside of our primary care doctors who are kind of the people who interface with probably the larger number of the population, those are the folks who probably take care of these um, types of questions and concerns more frequently. But what I will say is that either through a discussion with your primary care doctor, whether it's a family medicine person or an internist, um, or potentially to get you a referral to a urologist, so you could talk about that. In some instances, hormones are utilized. There are also... um, so there are pills that can be taken, and I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, is the machine just not running because it's been sitting dormant for a while? Or they can also check to make sure that there's no other 
other organic reason, like if there's a medical complication, sometimes um, men who have health problems, whether it's diabetes or hypertension, may have some difficulty um, with with that part, whether it's uh, sometimes people have problems with arousal. So if it's an arousal issue or if it's an erectile issue, if there's a medical problem, then they can address that first. If there isn't, then there are lots of other options. It may just be as simple as a pill, but there are also some mechanical um opportunities to help deal with problems that may exist there. And I love what you said, too, about making sure that your partner is enjoying it as well. And I would tell you that the first thing is going to be talking to talking to your partner. Um, And that may sometimes be a little, as you can tell here by me and my wonderful relationship with my partner right here, Dr. Brown, it can be a little awkward having the conversation to begin (laughs) with. But I mean, checking in just to see how it is and and what they like or or what works i think is really important and and there's it's great to be able to have that level of vulnerability and humility within your relationship to where it's about pleasing the other people other person and what it is that they actually like and enjoy but um i would say that the best decision making process about whether hormones or what might be right for you is going to be best done through working with a primary care doctor and then potentially a referral to a urologist um, who can kind of figure out what's going to be the best thing for you going forward. One thing that we know scientifically is that healthy, being healthy overall increases libido. So especially as we get older, you know, we accumulate certain uh, health problems more and more. So making sure that your baseline healthy and doing well is also very important. So I thought I would. No, I think that's actually really good. I mean, and you think about it, um, even for people who have chronic medical problems, like I even see that with women who become pregnant, like they might have bad medical problems, but once they get to feeling better, the first thing they typically do is have sex. And then next thing you know, we got a baby or something. And they'll be like, oh, I thought I was too sick to have me. I was like, well, the minute you feel better, that's what's going to happen. So here's another thing. If you are a person who has a chronic medical problem and you are of reproductive age and you do not want to be pregnant, then you need to think about contraception. If your partner is a person of reproductive age and you do not want to make a baby with that person, then you guys need to be thinking about contraception because it doesn't matter how sick you are. When you feel better, you're going to do it. When you feel better, you're going to do it. So just don't forget about that and be prepared. Prepare yourself in advance. Um, We are going to stay on the phone lines and hear from Kat, who's calling us from Mobile. Good morning, Kat. This is Mobile Day. It's Mobile Day. Mobile is charged with sexual energy, and I love it. I'm going to be careful next time I drive through. Doesn't help that I'm pregnant and talk oh. with you all. Um, <laughs> um, I love it for I the just, pregnant people who are still having sex. You go, girl. I just wanted you all to um, just kind of touch on the topic of higher desire and lower desire, men and women, because, you know, there's stereotypes that men are higher desire and women are lower desire. But if you could just uh, touch on that for both of the sexes. Absolutely. Dr. Brown, you want to start off? Well, you're the expert, Do you want to go honey. higher, higher or lower? <laughs> We're playing high low. Higher well, or lower. I would imagine that there is just natural variation. I think that probably is a stereotype, and that some women have a higher desire and some have lower, and the same for men. And I, I would think that selecting a partner that's more compatible with your your desire level is important, although they can change. Correct, Owen? Well, yeah, and you know, and so, and I think the other part is that um, so it is a stereotype. Um, However, when you look at behaviors and kind of also how we're socialized, right? Because, I mean, there are also social cues that we get about about sex and how certain things like for men, you know, multiple partners is kind of a thing. It's the manly way. And then but for women you know you're you don't want to be promiscuous you don't be again stereotypes absolutely so but i do believe that that's a really good question and a good point because there are men who also have um lower libido 
but those people don't really feed the stereotype, so they don't really get as much attention. But that does exist. Um, and likewise, there are women who also have, you know, higher sexual desires. Now, if you get to the whole point of, of sexual addiction, really, like less than 10 percent of the population truly meet criteria for having sexual addiction. So those are like the people who are in a whole different um, in a different realm. So this is not just oh, a person okay. who has a higher desire or a lower desire, but to those people who actually meet criteria to be considered sex addicts, it's actually a small subset of the population. But it's interesting. So, so there are also some medical complications that can predispose people or that can directly affect or impact um, your sexual desire. For example... There are s some women who have testosterone secreting tumors. Those women report more aggression, right? They want to fight more, um, or they feel a little a little bit angrier, a little bit more wound up, and also they report a much higher libido. So it's an underlying medical condition. Yeah, it's now, a reality. Now, look, if you're a person who's a female who really wants it, please don't believe that you're out, you, that you have a testosterone tumor. However, um, those if are... If you're growing a beard, though, it might be happening. So this is true. If you have male pattern baldness or excess facial then hair, then you should, you should at least get that checked out, at least get a testosterone level. But, um, but those kinds of things can actually also contribute. So I would say that Sexual desire is highly variable. It does not necessarily conform to um, to social norms or stereotypes. Um, and and the truth is that you can be a person who has a relatively low um, libido, and if you are paired with a low libido person, that might be perfect for you. You're in your sweet spot. And if you are a person with a high sex drive and you find somebody who is likewise compa uh, comparable, um, then that can be your sweet sweet spot. So I think within your relationship, the dynamics are really going to be the thing that determines that. Um, however, if wherever you find yourself is innately not pleasing to you, hear what I'm saying, innately not pleasing to you, um, or if it is creating a problem within your relationship, then perhaps that is... Uh, something that you should have a discussion with your. You don't have to compromise. Somebody's got to have to compromise. Well, either or both that, people. or 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 go and if and, you want the relationship to be successful, and talk it out and figure it out. Absolutely, um, but I think that's a really good point. That you know, people do have expectations about what is considered acceptable or normal, and I would say that when it comes to this, it's going to be the thing that makes you and your partner happy. Um, and and that's really all the normal that it needs to be. It's not. There's no certain time that's the average or whatever. Although in in our research, we did come across some pretty pretty interesting and wicked uh, information and some statistics. And so since we've got about eight more minutes left in the broadcast, I guess Dr. Brown, let's go back to a couple of your myths that um, that you were so excited about sharing earlier today. Why does this keep coming back to me? You've got a stack of papers in front of you. Mine were sort of interesting. That's like, what I'm saying. Because I thought, do people good, believe this? Good quirky facts. It was like, um, you can still get pregnant if you're in a swimming pool. Like, I guess people think that if you have sex in a swimming pool, you're not going to get pregnant. Like, this is a commonly seen one. So people say, so, okay, so let me just say, <laughs> Jay's as, laughing. look, as the OBGYN on, on, on this No matter on where you are, right now, if you have sex, you can get pregnant. Look. If you're on the moon. Oh, another this, one is it's position dependent. Like the swimming you pool, won't get pregnant swimming in certain pools, positions. The swimming pool is not a contraceptive. That's right. Period. Stop it. So, yes. Babies get made in the swimming pool. Babies get made in the swimming pool. Babies can be made in the swimming pool. Thank you very much for that. That actually might be the main idea of the show for today. What I thought would be... If that's not a t-shirt. Uh, oh, my gosh. What I thought might be good to talk about, Owens, is preg uh, sex during pregnancy. And I thought Kat was going to kind of get get more into that. But is sex safe during pregnancy? Is it ever not safe during pregnancy, et cetera? Such a good point. So, yes. And here's the thing. You will not harm the baby. Oh, no. We're just... We're this getting, is really important. Are, are we getting pregnant women in trouble? Like, no. they have a good excuse? So, so under most... So, 
So I under was in the most radio today. circumstances, it is it is safe and reasonable to continue to have sexual intercourse once pregnancy has been achieved. So under most circumstances, now there are a few high risk situations where we don't recommend that people. Um, continue to have sexual intercourse. That would typically be for those people who have um, placenta previa, which is where the actual afterbirth grows over the opening to the cervix because there's a risk for bleeding. Um, For people who have a cervical cerclage, which is a stitch that helps to to strengthen the cervix to hold it closed if people have a problem with holding in pregnancies. In those cases, we typically recommend that people have nothing in their vagina. Nothing. Period. Nothing. That includes... A man, nothing, nothing in the vagina. And we also encourage those people not to experience orgasms because the because when you have an orgasm, you will also contract. And if you're trying to decrease uterine activity, then the goal would be not to have uterine activity. So so with very few exception, yes, you can continue to have a healthy, robust sexual relationship even while pregnant unless you have a specific complication that your do- that your doctor advises you of. So in those instances, we say no to sexual um, sexual activity, but outside of that, um, absolutely. How about bleeding after sex in pregnancy and and not in pregnancy? So so yes, you can bleed after pregnancy. I'm sorry, bleed, you bleed after pregnancy. Yeah, you you can fun. bleed after intercourse in pregnancy. Um, and However, any time that you have bleeding in pregnancy, um, we consider that a cause for concern. Um, and the significance of that concern is really going to be based on when it occurs, um, how much bleeding and those kinds of things. So I would say any bleeding in pregnancy needs to be investigated. Um, it is not uncommon, however, to have some slight bleeding or spotting um, if you have intercourse during pregnancy. Um, and also sometimes, um, depending on the veracity of the activity, you may sometimes also experience a little bit of, um, of bleeding with intercourse. The vagina is um, a very forgiving area and so the the actual lining the tissues that line the vagina um, they are able to lubricate and provide um, necessary lubrication and and moisture and those kinds of things but occasionally you can get small tears in the vagina um, during sexual intercourse it is not uncommon for you to have profuse heavy bleeding um, and if you have consistent bleeding after Are you multiple, talking about pregnant women or not pregnant women? For anybody. For anybody. Mm-hmm. But if you, ha- if you are having consistent bleeding with intercourse, then that actually is something that should be, um, should be so followed up. So that is up. not normal. That is not okay. normal. Not normal. Important listening audience. You need Absolutely. to go see your doctor if you're having a lot of bleeding after sex regularly. What? Absolutely. What's another way to not get pregnant? <laughs> Oh, another way not to get pregnant. Well, or I, I to talked get to, pregnant. They talked about like sexual position. Some you can get pregnant, some you can't. Not it doesn't true. matter who's on top. No, doesn't matter. And also, it's not going to make you have a boy or a girl. That's true. Um, and diet doesn't doesn't influence that either. That's also something that people um, have been very concerned about. Oh, here's one: wearing two condoms is not better. It's worse. I've never heard, I've oh never heard of that one. That's but really you know, careful. I wear double gloves like at work and stuff. But Oh, my gosh. That's Let, something else. One other thing for Kat, you know, we were talking about um, this issue of sexual, uh, about how, like, sexual libido or what have you. One of the things that I did find is that there was a study that was done in Ohio State uh, University. Um, and it basically shows that um, it reported that men think about sex 188% more than women. So that's just, look, it was one study that may not be everybody, testosterone brain. but it just lets you know, like it was crazy. So, and here's the thing in this particular study, the men's number of, of thoughts topped out at 388. So they're having what like 2.3, no, 2.3 times an hour. Wow. Yeah. And the women and in women, the highest number was 140, but the average was about 9.9. <laughs> so, so the 140 was way out. 
you know, on the spectrum. That was the highest of all of them. But it just goes to show, and this is about how often you thought about sex Men in a week. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. It's how true. often you thought about sex in a week. Oh, in a week. That's okay. A, yeah. On a day, I was like, oh, no, no, no. Lord, have mercy. How do you get anything done? Yeah. 388 yeah. times in one week. Okay. There are only seven days in a week. Ladies and gentlemen, seven days. Um, And the highest was 140 in women. So it's just, you know, just a little um, scientific fun fact from one isolated study. But it does kind of demonstrate some of the differences that may exist and kind of the differences in, you know, perceptions between genders. Hmm. Science is a thing. (laughs) It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. Um, So I also wanted to say that there's um, there's also this. the the issue of one night stands this came up in one of the things that I was reading talking about who are the people like who's enjoyed them versus not Did you, so this research shows that um, eighty percent of men enjoyed their one night stands but when women describe their one night stands fifty three percent of them drank beforehand um, but if the if that person was a stranger it was actually eighty nine percent of people drank beforehand lower your inhibition indeed so guys be careful be careful be careful um well the music is playing jay thank you so much uh, for chiming in for playing the music so no, this is over for, oh no <laughs> no that would be me for chiming you in for i know that, that was on behalf Owens of Allie. could go all day long indeed guys thank you so much for calling with great questions um we will be back same time same bat channel next week um, for Southern Remedy for Women. Foot show next week, right? Yeah, foot show next week. So Woo! bring out your feet and your Vicks Vapor Rub. We'll be here with Dr. <laughs> Stephanie Thomas. Liz Gill was our call screener. Um, for Dr. Allie Brown, I'm Dr. Michelle Owens. NPR's Here Now is next on MPB Think Radio. You guys be safe.